Talking about contemporary Iranian photography, I think oh, there's quite a bit of a history behind it. And photography and image making, <laughs> of course, filmmaking. Um, after the Islamic Revolution of Iran in 1979, there was a bit of a, um, not a bit, actually a very long period of silence. No one knew about what's happening outside Iran, uh, in, outside Iran from inside. We actually had very, very limited access to, to the events outside Iran. And also um, the world didn't know what's happening inside Iran. And as I said, there was almost 20 years of silence. And um, all was getting out of Iran was images of war at the beginning. And after that, uh, it started like um, the Islamic government of Iran started to represent Iran in the outside world as a very um, purely Islamic country. And that was it. That's what the world knew about us. It was only after 1970, 1997, the election of President Khatami in Iran, that the, it came a period of um, social openness. And they called it like the dialogue of cultures. And suddenly, after, during that time, um, artists, writers, everyone got really excited because they had the opportunity to talk and put their voice out there and talk about things that they were not allowed to talk about before. So. During that time, uh, photography as a medium somehow uh, nourished and developed a lot. And because it was newspapers um, publishing images that previously they were all like censored and they were not allowed to be published. So um, this openness in the media somehow made documentary photography and photojournalism the dominant genre in photography, Iranian photography. and. Um, Photographers were focusing on the theme of um, social injustice, oppression, war, and poverty, and um, the lack of welfare in Iran. And um, after a long period of doing that, uh, because uh, it was getting a lot of attention also in the Western world, people were like, really, they wanted to know what's happening inside, and photographers were sending images outside, uh, and it was all focused on the theme of trauma. So. Intellectuals, artists started questioning why, why we are like, all we are getting out of the country, like sending it out there is this voice of trauma and why it's the only theme that we are focusing on. So even one of the uh, famous art critics, Hamid Severi, yeah. Severi, he also called that type of photography geography, yeah. which means beggography, beggography, I think it's hard to translate both. So it was like somehow trying to get attention of um, the Western world. And from there, then artists started, a big group of artists started to shift their focus from social and political issues and focus on more art-oriented sort of themes or autobiographical or, um, I don't know, just um, abstraction and very much inspired by Western styles of art making. So this has created a big division between um, artists and also it gave it a big variety um, uh, of um, images coming out of Iran. So um, there was currently there's a big confusion about in the Western world specifically or let's say out of Iran about the reality of Iran. What is the reality of Iran? And um, it is kind of like resulted from this uh, all these political and social changes that is kind of like happening quite rapidly. And um, also it's about like all these contradictory images coming out of Iran and artists are trying to expose um, um, the reality of Iran, a country which was previously perceived as a purely Islamic country. And now everyone's seeing lots of images and narratives coming out that is somehow um, rejecting all those former sort of um, conceptions, that single narrative. Uh, despite all the variety, there's one theme that is quite consistent in the work of uh, Iranian image makers, uh, and that's the crisis of identity or the question of identity. Because 
uh, when you're an Iranian, it doesn't matter if you're living inside Iran or outside Iran. There's always this, uh, the public persona and private lives uh, is two distinct sort of zones and matters. And uh, who you are and what you know about yourself is always in contrast with what the society inside Iran expects you to be and also how the outside Iran people somehow perceive you as a potential terrorist or also this um, so-called third world identity. So we're constantly fighting with that. We're constantly trying to um, somehow break those sort of conceptions. And um, that's why we see this sense of urgency in the work of Iranian artists, that uh, they're constantly um, struggling with the personal, social, political issues uh, and uh, in their life and somehow despite all the censorship uh, that is applied to the works of Iranian artists, today we see that they're taking the risk, they're creating images that are speaking of the reality of Iran in a very bold and brave sort of language. And um, they're trying to expose the hidden and censored or misrepresented identity and history and culture of Iran in the world. And as I said, it's a big risk for many Iranian artists who are making either in Iran or outside just to speak of the truth. And um, one more thing that I wanted to say was about um, contemporary Iranian photography, which in my uh, opinion is um, exactly like the current condition in Iran is somehow utilizing the uh, elements of Western modernity and also uh, they're seeking some sort of um, local alternatives to that. And um, the variety of the voices that are coming out of Iran is somehow breaking all these stereotypical conceptions and is revealing and reflecting the complexity and heterogeneous nature of Iranian people and um, the, the current society of Iran. And one of the artists that I think her work is somehow uh, representing that complex uh, and multi-layered nature of Iranian uh, identity and society is the work of Gohar. And um, as we can see, it's a speaking of the truth and reality of Iran, yet the pain is there, the experience of war and everything is there, but it's speaking through a very different language that uh, is not familiar, we haven't seen it before. And um, for those who are from Iran, we know that this is us, this is our reality. So my question for Goha is, um, how do you think your work is breaking those stereotypes? And how do you think your work is speaking about that complexity? And what kind of strategies did you use in creating the work to achieve that in your images? Mm -hmm. Mm, I'm artist, I'm not an activist and my idea came from my society but majority of idea about my life and my experiences and when I want to do a project just trust myself and so and maybe sometimes I think uh, very personal and I'm happy when the people you know talk about it and understand it and sometimes I have a really you know a uh, critic about my work, it's very indifferent uh, idea and, and I like it because it's open, it's like it has a different layer and so the people in different uh, interests can uh, understand my work. But about the audience, uh, I, I have never think about the audience when I want to do my project. It's just my main focus about, you know, I want to, you know, it's like as an art, it's an art, and I want to do. Uh, I want to be free when I want to do a pro uh, art project. Maybe it's the reason I'm an artist, not, you know, engineer. Yeah. Uh, Are yeah. you calling me an engineer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Thank you. And um, uh, my next question is from Romak, and um, you know when we make narrative-based or documentary work about Iran, either it's real or fictional, there's always this possibility of your work being uh, kind of like misunderstood or um, turning into another single narrative of a stereotypical um, sort of uh, conceptions. And um, as you were saying, when you were making the work, when you were 
showing the work. One of the concerns was uh, that, you know, it's somehow um, might turn, like the audience might look at your images and think that this is actually Iranian weddings and mm -hmm. that's how they all look like. And this is exactly like, uh, for, for all of us Iranians, this is our weddings. Yep. And it's my, uh, but why when you were making the work, your intention was to focus on a smaller sort of community who are living in the skirts of Tehran. And you were amazed by their approach towards beauty and the way that they were like, uh, the contrast between tradition and modernity. So uh, why do you, how often your work is, do your documentary work is, um, gets misunderstood or misread in here? And wha what, what do you think causes that problem? And how do you fight against it? Actually, I'm really thinking here in Australia, in Australian community, they don't have s too much knowledge about Middle East. I'm not talking about Iran because I believe we are all from same culture. We are from Middle East. I'm not from Iran. I'm from Middle East. So I think, you know, here it's people, they have not too much knowledge about Middle East. And Iranian image makers and artists, they didn't represent Middle East and Iran properly. And I think as an artist, this is our job. This is, this is a thing we have to do here to represent and show different faces of Iran or Middle East. I think here, like, we just see the one face of Iran or Middle East, and I, I'm not angry with that. If we show the different faces of Iran, this is this, this is our culture, this is, and we don't have to be shy, because I found out in Iranian community, we, I had, like, so many comments, like, people just say, oh, why you are showing these photos? This is not us. <coughs> but I believe Iranian, uh, Iranian weddings, it's us. I was in the wedding last year, actually, in my brother-in-law. And that was the same, the same makeup, the same, like, you know, exaggerate, exaggerating everything. So the point for me is we don't have to be shy. We have to show our culture. Like all of the cultures around the world, we have the good things and bad things. And it's not a shame to show this culture. That's us, and I really proud that. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And also with your work, um, as you said, you know, when you make documentary work, somehow people think, uh, tend to think of you as the holder of the truth and reality. And um, when you pick up that role, it comes with a big responsibility, right? So um, as you were saying, it's a big sort of agenda for you to somehow not misrepresenting the people that you're um, kind of like um, making movie about, but also trying to add a different kind of like perspective to it. What were your strategies in uh, doing that? Oh, you really want to make me an engineer. <laughs> 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 Look, I'm actually very surprised at what you say, Gohar, because I, I find my approach, and I think certainly it probably has to do with how I was raised. Mm. Um, you know, having to deal with different cultures, different languages, and. As a migrant, I guess what you go through is a process of trying to fit in and, or be liked, um, hence my humor. Um, you, I mean, when I create the work, I, I do think about what the audience uh, is going to pre and not, you know, perceive. And also, um, when, I mean, we're talking about filmmaking, so perhaps, I mean, I don't know if the, the concepts are different, but when I'm making film, I need to actually know who is it for. In fact, I have one person in mind that needs to see this film, and that person could be a, an archetype. Um, but if I'm making a f work that is going to be for an Iranian person, for example, or an Afghan person in Love, Marriage, and Kabul, that film is going to be a different film. Mm. Um, perhaps I wouldn't really need to go into the culture too much uh, or try to answer a lot of the questions that an Afghan person already knows by heart because they're Afghan. So it's important for me who I'm making the film for because it shapes this narrative, the questions, the, the interaction that I'm um, sort of interested in. And also, uh, I guess I hold the insider outsider kind of position. I'm, I've raised and just sort of learned about both cultures. I've, I've been going back to Iran. I'm really glad, actually, I uh, had an opportunity to live in Iran when I was in high school. So it allowed me to learn the language better and I can speak. In also preserve my accent. 
Um, so it sort of was very important for me when I'm creating the work that I uh, know who it's for. Now, you know, I made Love, Marriage and Couple for a non-Afghan audience, and an Afghan audience have seen it in Melbourne, like we had 200 people there, and yeah, they, they the appreciated, their response was luckily good. And you What know, about I, towards the first one, the first series, uh, the movie that you made? Oh, uh, so like the, the first one, I don't think they, they perhaps, uh, I don't know even, I didn't have really a personal uh, experience there, but I'm sure as it happened for me, an Afghan person perhaps wouldn't have liked, like a lot of people that, you know, Ramak is mentioning about looking at their work. I mean, I run the Persian Film Festival, and sometimes mm -hmm. I show films that are not all happy. Uh, well, I guess films really can, they need to have a problem in order mm -hmm. to be formed. Um, and a lot of Iranian mm -hmm. audience members come out and tell me, why are you always showing films that are negative? Well, I haven't made them, I just curate the program. But um, it's a question because we are, as a society who lives in, who lives abroad or in host countries, we are very much uh, aware and sometimes nervous about how we are represented. And uh, if you're an Iranian nowadays, you know, uh, your case is actually a brilliant case. Um, I read an My article case. that an Iranian photographer has won the prize of, you know, best photography. Migrant Iranian. <laughs> a migrant <laughs> Iranian. It's got to be. And I'm <laughs> like, yes, because the month before that was an Iranian killed someone in the Westfield shopping mall. I was like, <laughs> damn. Yeah, you like goes. it as an Iranian, but yeah. I sometimes wonder why it can't be like Hoda Afsha won the prize. Why I, my name is like, has to come with migrant Iranian photographer won the prize. Sure, like, and, I, yeah. I mean, it's an... Um, <laughs> It's a cycle, it's a discourse that always happens. I mean, you look at uh, Iranian cinema, every single article, as my role in the, sort of the curator of the festival here, uh, every time I get interviewed, the first question is about censorship. It's a, so there always is like the political framework. Luckily, I mean, you know, we, <laughs> we talked yesterday and I said like, you know, yeah, Farhadi won the, an Oscar and it's huge sort of privilege for us and we feel very proud, but it was in the category of foreign film. So we are always categorized, and Iranian cinema has always been, I don't know why, but it always gets looked at uh, in a political framework, yeah. uh, not as cinema. You know, I mean, it does, but it sort of gets there eventually. There always yeah. is that look, and, we, and you talked about it in your paper today. It's something that I guess we're caught in at the moment, and I think it's our job as Iranians to actually present um, at, you know, personal stories with diversity and as a result, humanize. Um, we need more narratives, people. right? Yeah, more narratives, more diverse narratives. Yeah. And, I, I, you know, and I guess that's um, what I'm interested in. And that is why I look at the audience. And uh, you know, that's, those are the, th I think, things that I think about. If I may add, for my current film, yeah, yeah I, I actually I felt a little bit afraid. And it was actually a talk with my parents and they were like are you sure you want to make this film because you know how the Iranian society are and they're gonna label you and they're gonna <laughs> you know because you know I'm a f uh, I you know in order to make a film you got to get close yeah. yeah I can't have like an arm's distance you got to actually engage you got to be open yeah. I cannot go on that journey and go I already know you guys are full of <laughs> stuff yeah. and uh, you know just make a film that's one-sided no uh, I need to engage on a level to understand and, and need to, you know, I have my curiosity. They're part of my society. Yeah. Um, could be part of our families or neighbors, etc. I mean, if you're living in Iran, you're used to that. Um, yeah. But, you know, so there's, I was a little bit afraid of that. I mean, I obviously come to terms with it and just like, whatever, I'm going to make it. Um, because it is something that's important for me. And... Uh, this time, I actually have the Iranian society in mind who live abroad, specifically. So I've got someone specific in mind, but it is a person who has been living abroad after the revolution and has not experienced war. Because, hmm. you know, for our society, yeah. especially those who live abroad, and I'm talking so much, I'm sorry, there has been an interruption. One has been the revolution, is a huge interruption, yeah. and many have left. And then there's been another interruption in our Which society war, that's yeah. been the war. And those who grew up during the war have, a, although little I'm in some cases, mm -hmm. they have uh, had a, oh, a different not. understanding of what the society turned into mm -hmm. um, 
in comparison to those that did not and left after the revolution. So I'm very interested in that and that I'm making the film for those yeah. who have not experienced it. But just, you know, I have one question. You know, as a photographer, when I do a project and I, after the first show, I cannot control my audience. It's like, it could be everywhere, published in a book, a magazine, <coughs> newspaper, internet, and it's how you can control it. It's something you do a project for, you know. Sure, uh, it's actually not a question of control. Um, as I said, I mean, you know, you make the work, it gets pr presented and people take what they take. And yeah. in fact, that's the beauty of it. I mean, they look at it with their own filters and that's what they take mm -hmm. away. I have in mind who it is for in my mind. Okay. And I've, I have that one, person or that group mm -hmm. in my mind and I make the film because it as I said it sort of helps the construction of okay. the narrative I'm telling and yeah. Uh, yeah but then you know it shows and some people yeah. love it some people hate it whatever I mean it's mm -hmm. out there yeah but I think it's also like I think I can understand your position because for someone like myself who practiced in Iran as a photographer and then moved here the nature of my work changed a lot because um, I used to be a documentary photographer, purely documentary photographer, working on social issues and from prostitution to uh, religious ceremonies and all that. But uh, then when I came here, every time I tried to show the work to someone, it was suddenly like the attention, the um, um, response that I was getting, like I could tell that it might like make people think that a lot of uh, women in Tehran are prostitutes now or uh, those religious ceremonies that are like they're killing animals on the street, sacrificing animals and it's quite violent and we understand it quite purely when we are living in Iran that it's a part of like that huge 70, 80 million people who are living in Iran and this is a group of people who are holding these ceremonies. And those local issues can be discussed in mm -hmm. Iran and negotiated and talked about. But when you take them outside Iran and put them here in this context, suddenly it gives this image of Iran as this like sacrificing animals. We are barbaric, we're horrible. And yeah. Um, can I just say something? Yeah, I sure. Think what you're saying is quite true, but also I just felt that it, it felt like me that there is a kind of strong feeling of Yeah, of course. And, and I think it's a lot of time you focus the kind of on creating the kind of the true image in your audience on yeah. how to kind of make kind of lose the focus on what what's really happening. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with you. You can't like make everyone happy or just uh, whatever you do, it will always get questioned or misread or mis. Uh, it's kind of like there will be those issues. But what we are struggling with, I think our position is quite, and that was actually what I was going to talk about, the responsibility of you as, as, as the artist who is coming from, let's say, Iran, is different from uh, what you do like here as a Western artist because uh, I think there are more eyes on us and there are a lot of, people are looking at what we're talking about pe because people want to know what's happening in Iran and now there's a bigger sort of interest <coughs> about Iran and its reality because of this opportunity that we have to expose the reality of Iran. So I think it's quite a tricky sort of um, line and um, I personally struggle a lot. I think about my audience too. When I was in Iran, I wasn't thinking about it. I was just making work and it gets kind of like approved by a group of people and some people dislike it and we put it out there and move to the next work. But then here, because our voice is getting heard in the outside world, we have some sort of a responsibility. So that's why personally I stopped making documentary work for a while and I didn't show any of my documentary work here in Australia. And I shifted my practice to more of a like art oriented conceptual sort of practice to talk about those issues through a different sort of um, aesthetic. And um, I, the concepts that I was focusing on also shifted because I felt like 
uh, I need to create that dialogue. If I'm personally, as an individual, fight, uh, struggling with all those wrong conceptions about my identity as an Iranian, it's my responsibility to do something about it, you know? I n I'm not sure if I'm managing, as I said at the end of my talk, I'm not sure if I managed to do it, but at least I think we need to create that dialogue. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. But also, I just wanted to kind of um, share my experience, but I think part of it also is um, maybe sometimes it's not that they are really like looking for what's happening; they are just looking for the approval of what they've been thinking mm. Mm, to affirm yeah. their own. Um, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, I think when you have that sort of platform to, uh, instead of like ignoring it and saying that you know what you know and I don't care, yeah. um, I can't change your mind. As an artist, you have a platform to, um, maybe there's an opportunity to change it. So at least create that sort of dialogue, talk about it and do something about it. I think our role is quite important, especially in this time as artists, because we are turning um, social, political, rough sort of subjects into we are using humor, we are using cinematic language, we are using so many different uh, approaches to somehow uh, turning it into a visual sort of language, something that aesthetically is engaging the audience and also uh, are trying to create some sort of a conversation with them and um, maybe the opportunity to change their mind or adding <coughs> one other sort of narrative to what, ex what already exists in the society. And I think it's about the, sort of the environment you're living in, actually. I mean, uh, yeah, the stereotypes exist. And uh, frankly, you can't really completely change them because people have their own backgrounds, their own filters. But if you're aware of them, you could be smart about it and lure them in and then show them a different <laughs> car. <laughs> And we can't just continue blaming Western society because we are, just like as I mentioned, uh, we play a huge role in that too. That's why I'm saying it's quite important instead of ignoring it or just feeding that desire in the society, keep making the work that is familiar to the uh, uh, conception of the audience that we have because it's easier to understand it because th this is what they know. So let me make work that uh, can communicate to them easily, so get more attention. Instead of that, we have to somehow uh, um, giving them something that they haven't seen before. It's also our artists, our filmmakers, our image makers that has been constantly making those kind of work that is somehow affirming that sort of mentality. So we can't only blame um, the Western society. It's half of it is our own sort of uh, mistakes and problems. Yep. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm an artist myself. I've been away from Iran for 17 years, but, and my art is very arty as well. And for me, it's very interesting to see three women and one man, one man, not like any of it. But I want not very masculine no, here. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> That's good, I know you. Mm. But, uh, uh, you know, for me, I think this uh, actually creating the stereotype about the Iranian women actually started with Shirin in the shop. Although I respect her a lot because she opened the like, way for us mm -hmm. to represent our world, but what she presented was very misleading. And, uh, but going back to another topic, because that was just I wanted to mention whatever comment you have. Uh, because I've been away from Iran, I want to see how did Iranian government sees the Iranian women in this pioneering role. You are, it seems to me that they do lots of work because they've been not suppressed in a way that she in the short present, in a way that they want to show different image of, image of themselves to the world as a threat, or they just ignore it simply, or they actually encourage it. The government? Yes. The government. I don't know what they think. Yeah. I'm not them. I'm sure they, they're not satisfied about it. There, but mm, I don't know. I think they are going. I think because they don't like this face of Iranian women anyway. Because you know it's a Muslim country, so they're gonna show that face they like uh, of Iranian women. I think they don't like it anyway. But they never liked it. Yeah. So. But they ignoring it or they don't. 
I think they're just ignoring. I think it's just like uh, um, now not um, easy to control that anymore because mm -hmm. it's not one, two, three women going against the government. It's actually the majority of Iranian yeah. women yeah, opposing right. those forces. So uh, if they want to arrest every single one of them, they have to like arrest maybe 90% yeah. of Iranian women. Yeah. So I, I personally don't know exactly what they think. I'm not mm. the government, but <laughs> I'm pretty sure that they're not happy about it. And also about Shirin Nishad, I think um, I have lots of respect for her as an artist. Uh, I think personally, again, I criticize her work myself, but not her work. It's the continuation of what has started after Shirin Nishad. She as an individual uh, who migrated to uh, America from Iran when she was young, after 18 years, she goes back to Iran and sees the country after the Islamic Revolution. And those work that she made, was her response as an individual towards her experience. Like she saw all the Iranian women suddenly in vain and somehow that was her reaction to, to what she experienced in, in a country that she used to call home, right? So yeah, she made those images, but the amount of attention that she got, uh, like in, ev it's been like 20, 15 years it's since then and every single exhibition of contemporary Middle Eastern art exhibition, global art, um, Iranian art, 15 years, 20 years, every single exhibition you see Shirin Nishat's images of women of Allah. And it got a huge <coughs> amount of attention. And that's what started that sort of trend, that every single female artist coming out of Iran, they want to become famous. They make work of about women in veil and suppressed. And that's what I was talking about, that we can't blame Western society yeah, solely for that. It's also us doing something like that, creating that sort of conception about our identity. Okay. Sorry, just before we can do your questions, who's got mic two? Yeah. Can I just on my phone? We'll just get three. Can you turn yours on? Oh. Okay. Hello, people. <coughs> um, this is a quick question for both the artists that um, have worked here in Australia and also for Gohar. Um, I just wanted to know um, how do you think your work is impacting the artists in Iran, and do you feel a responsibility to, in to have an impact on them? Um, for them not to be as lazy as before and start working and mm -hmm. work more. <laughs> and also for Gohar, do you, when, when you work in Iran, how much um, do you get yourself involved into seeing and uh, exploring more about um, artists, Iranian artists outside of Iran? Mm -hmm. so Where is the responsibility both for you as an um, Iranian working inside Iran and for these guys? Mm -hmm. um, it's I think it's a really good question because I always think about it I'm also I used to be living in Berlin two years and some artists live in Iranian <laughs> artists live in Berlin and and I when in the two years I was in Berlin and I couldn't do, do any artwork there not, not maybe for responsibility or something that you talk about it. Maybe because my work about the society and I couldn't touch my society. So I just, I look at some from virtual image of my society. So I think it's like, you know, how can I work about my society and I cannot touch it. It's always, you know, it's, it, maybe it's a really, uh, one of the important reasons I back to Tehran again. So, because I wanted to stay more, but decided because I couldn't do any art for after the two years, it's nothing. What what I'm doing here? So I, I take back to Tehran. Was that because you didn't have material? Or no, no, not material. About the idea and so Inspiration. exactly, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Uh, and sometimes when I talk with the artists, live outside and grow up, especially grow up outside of Iran, they have a different perspective with the Iranian that live inside. But they cannot talk about the you know, other artists are here because it's not a long time that they live here. 
it's you know it's, it's completely different perspective every year every year you travel to Tehran also you had the experience you talk about the last year your experience and it's like they involved with you know Iranian art society so it's different but generally yeah I completely agree with you it's like it's a different perspective yeah so where do we find that time <laughs> common border say for you to become to have not really have the same language because you um, all of you sort of like representing different work um, but where is that common border and how do we mm -hmm. start sharing it so that we're all talking about not a wrong image um, yeah. I don't want to just label it by wrong image but um, say to um, reflect more and more of the um, the reality in Iran Mine does. Do you want mine? Mine doesn't. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. It's not working. Uh, for me personally, it's interesting that you were saying it, it was also for me when I moved to Australia <coughs> eight, nine years ago. For almost two years, I couldn't make any work. It, it's like um, I'm not, my work was all about Iran. And then I'm here. I have to, I started taking my camera outside on the streets, taking pictures, and everything was on the surface. I had no idea about what's happening in Australia, what are the serious issues. I didn't feel like I'm entitled to make any comment about it. So uh, for two years almost, I, I was getting really depressed about not making any work and felt like, okay, that's the end of my career as an artist. Um, I started like doing a sculpture course. I was like, I can't take pictures anymore here. Maybe I start from scratch doing something different. But then what I personally believe is that your art's got to come from here and you have to be true to yourself and what is true to your world. And um, yeah, I stopped making documentary work about Iran because I wasn't there. There was this virtual image, exactly as Gohar said, now that I couldn't like, um, again, feeling like that I'm entitled to comment about it. But I could talk about myself and my experience and things that I'm struggling. For example, the image that the society has about me as people ask me, even at universities, how come you're educated if you're from Iran? And I'm like, seriously, 70% of uh, students at universities in Iran are women. And lots of weird questions like, why you're not veiled? Oh, you want to make work, make work about veiled women. So all these things kind of like inspired me to make something that is, if I'm a struggling with that image, um, I have to somehow create a, dialogue, uh, create a dialogue and say that, no, this is not the reality. So that borderline, I think what you're saying is, um, it doesn't matter if you're in Iran or outside Iran, as long as you're um, true to yourself, and you're focusing on yourself and your own narrative as an individual, your own journey, um, I think you can have an impact. And also, uh, yeah, it's a big concern, always has been for me, how my work is going to be perceived by the Iranian artist community. And it's always huge and gives you some sort of anxiety that <laughs> they're gonna start <laughs> questioning you. They're gonna like not like your work and they're gonna call you an outsider. So it's, it's not easy, yeah. Hi. Um, first of all, thank you to all of you. Really enjoyed each one of your talks. So thank you very much for sharing that. Um, my question is for Gohar. I'm wondering, in Iran, what kind of photography are the artists, the young artists, influenced by? What are you seeing? What is being talked about? Mm. How? What is the art world, the photography world like mm -hmm. in Tehran? Um, we have a t three good uh, university in Tehran. They have, you know, also photography department and they are very active so and every department focus you know for instance this the university that I study is focused on technique so and the, I think the your university was more you know focus on the idea and they had you had a really good professor you know like Mehra Mwajan and the others so uh, so uh, it, uh, so all of the uh, um, photography uh, in Iran, it's, uh, it exists. You know, documentary, stage photography, fine art photography. But af in the, after the Green Movement, and uh, it's not, it was not very easy to take a picture outside, so documentary is suddenly disappear. So, yeah, and focus on fine art photography. 
and now the fine art photography is much more active. So because maybe, and now again the university talk about and, uh, documentary photography because it is completely stopped. But the history of photography in Iran, it depends on documentary about the wartime revolution and, you know, in the, in the, even uh, Qajar era. So uh, now you can have all of, you know, field of photography in Iran. But the main focus in, uh, you know, set everything. Uh, it could be stage photography, still life, or something like that. I think it's much more active. And are the artists that you're looking at Iranian artists, Middle Eastern artists, American artists, Australian artists, European? American, American artists. Because <laughs> I can see the influence in this yeah. body of work. Yeah. Um, but that's where, my, you know, what are you teaching in the universities? Yeah. American. Mm. American artists is very important. I think I, it's my oh, university. Yeah. It was like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Majority of our references yeah. are American. American. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, sorry, Ramak, I'm actually a uh, language uh, teacher, and I can say that your English is actually very well. Oh. Um, <laughs> I'm actually currently doing research on uh, language as as protest, but using um, images that came from the um, different you know things that happened in Iran. Uh, images, um, the English language, and while doing my research, I'm often um, friends and family come to me and they say, you know, you've got to be careful because I do travel to Iran, I have family in Iran. Um, my first question to the whole panel is, how much do you censor yourself? I, I do realize that you're taking, you know, you're, you're showing your work within Australia, but how much do you censor yourself? Um, and a particular question for Hoda. Um, uh, you touched on um, feminism and different, how men, I think, within Middle Eastern societies have put on the veil themselves to show support for women. Um, we've seen this in uh, the Taliban in Afghanistan, um, uh, men, Afghani men wearing the burqa uh, in Turkey, men wore the hijab as well. And there was a movement within Iran that uh, men were taking photos with scarves and putting it on the internet. Um, do you think that helps the gays? That, you know, with looking at, um, a is it helping women basically by them wearing their head covering or is it actually like is it actually helping the discourse or not thank you i personally um kind of like disagree with that because by um like wearing veil um as a way of like showing your solidarity with islamic women you're already kind of like claiming them as a victim you know and i personally uh, think that, and I know so many Islamic women, that they choose to wear veil. This is their belief. This is what they chose to do. It's, yeah, a lot of suppression, a lot of stories, a lot of narratives about them being forced into it, but there are also a lot of women who believe in it and they actually don't feel comfortable getting um, out without it and this is their personal view about the world and this is how they feel comfortable but we never get to hear that voice and i find it really disrespectful towards those women you know and who choose to do it and this solidarity this constant putting them in the position of a victim why because necessarily it's not something that we choose to do and why we constantly f feel like if you are in veil you are somehow um, a victim you know so I don't think it's actually those kind of like uh, reactions towards it is somehow helping um, the uh, uh, sorting out the issue or helping it at all. It's actually adding more to that one single narrative. I think in terms of uh, helping those people uh, or changing the views about um, kind of like uh, veiling in, in the society, we need to at least instead of like becoming the voice of them and representative of them, we, uh, if we want to help. I think we all certainly think about it. I mean, I've got extended family in Iran. My family name is Palangi, which people make fun of, <laughs> um, because it means a leopard. And we are very, this family name, I don't know, I mean, I know where it comes from, but uh, it is unique. So there's like one family line and they're Palangis. It's like, okay. So if I do something here that is not accepted through the parameters, for example, or that the border <laughs> or the line that you're talking about, 
Yeah, I, I do think about how it's going to impact on my family in Iran. Uh, it's, it's actually a really weird concept. I, I remember I was agitated one day, quite angry actually, that I'm not actually living there, but I'm still um, limited by some of the boundaries simply because I care about my family. And myself going back to Iran, I don't want to lose that connection. So it's the current times and you just deal with it. Um, I don't take it too hard on me simply because um, there are laws everywhere. Uh, you know, like you live here, you've got certain boundaries. You live there, you've got certain boundaries. Some you like, some you don't like. You make work. Sometimes there's stories you want to tell and the society in which you're living in at the time is not ready for. So you either find a way to present it in a form that is accepted and you still say what you want to say or you wait. <coughs> You wait a little bit and, you know, societies evolve and there would be a time for it to be presented. So the short answer would be, no, I don't self-censor because there's this angry guy inside who wants to push the boundaries and or play with the line. Um, but I think it's certainly something that we consider. Yeah, we always find our ways <laughs> around it, you know. <laughs> it's just like something that you start <laughs> learning from very early stages, everything that you do. And that's interesting, we do everything that you do here, but things happen inside the houses. And um, we're just always constantly trying to find a way of getting around it, yeah. get it done. And uh, being an artist in Iran is always everything that you do is taking a risk. And artists are taking those risks more than ever before at the moment. Yeah. And may I say, in fact, I mean, you could actually look at it positively. I mean, you wouldn't want to, but it adds to the complexity of the work produced sometimes. I mean, I, I hope people don't take that against me. I'm not <laughs> looking for a, a society that freedom, there is no freedom of speech or ideas. I'm just saying that what has happened currently, let's say through cinema, has been that Iranian f film directors have pushed the boundaries or played with that boundary so much that it has created this amazing body of work with a lot of context and international appeal. So. Yeah, you could say that the job of a film, an artist, is to be a witness and is to present what they think is happening through the way within the boundaries in which exist or not to present it. And that's, I think, what people are, are doing. Last question. Last question. Okay. Um, thank you very much for uh, sharing your ideas and work with us here. Um, my question is because the um, idea of audience was mentioned in everyone's talk, would you still be doing the same thing if you had um, presupposed an audience wider than Western audience? And if you're presupposing that kind of audience, isn't your work somehow fitting into the Orientalist discourse that you're trying to deconstruct? Mm. Thanks. No, I, I mean, I. I am, you know, very interested in the colonial um, Edward Said Orientalist discourse and all that, in fact. So that's why I said that, you know, you've got to become aware of the stereotypes, lure the audience in, and then show them a different card. Because it, it's something that actually exists. So when I talk about the audience, there, I think there's two choices. Uh, if you look at a, a society as a tribe, you're either from the tribe or you're not. So I'm not just talking about the Western audience, I'm talking about the audience in my work that is either from the tribe or not. So yeah, they could be from the Western or Asian. Or the other forms a, a different view about um, the tribe. So there's that outsider and insider discourse that I think is happening. So it is how you fit within the Orientalist perspective or how you challenge it or how you play with it. it I think it's... That's, I guess, what I think about audience when I'm um, creating work. I think um, there's no way out of it. We are in it. We are like, uh, you, uh, of course, everything that we do is somehow related to that Orientalist sort of conversation that Edward Said has started. And uh, we are either breaking that or we are feeding it. And even when you're um, making abstract, uh, abstract sort of work to avoid those kind of um, uh, sort of traps, still you are a part of it because you are following 
Western sort of styles of art practice to somehow claim that you're not political or you're not oriental or you're not this and that. So uh, yeah, it definitely does <coughs> fit into that sort of category. Um, if I'm, uh, as I said, what I do is based on my personal experiences and I'm not living in China. Yeah, I think actually if my work goes to China, the Chinese audience will also somehow uh, can relate to it because uh, we are kind of like the world is becoming somehow standardized through that um, sort of, uh, uh, if th we, we are being fed through a homogenized sort of vision. So it does go everywhere. And the Chinese people can read this story of me, for example, as an Iranian woman who's uh, struggling with her image is in, in a Western country that I'm living at. So that's why I'm, what, why I'm making this work, because it's my narrative, it's my story. So if I live in Latin America and um, I struggle with something else, or even maybe I don't struggle, I have a really happy life, I make work about it. Uh, so uh, that, yeah, that's my personal perspective. I, I like to mention. Uh, yeah, yeah, you should. Yeah. All right, I'll buy you coffee. <laughs> so um, I like to actually um, draw your attention to this fact that I think um, there's, I think, if you're talking about an, uh, creating an original work, I mean, in English we say originality, right? So it, the work is like origin originality, right? It's, so the more personal it is, essentially, the more human it is, the more universal. So if, I, if you notice throughout my work, I was talking about my second love marriage in Kabul, and I was after a love story, because you know what? Everyone's fallen in love with the girl next door, or at least close to. So we understand that we, uh, it's a love story, it's shared, the context is different, the culture, the way we go about it is different, but you're dealing with a personal story. Perhaps a way to get out of that binary is to uh, use personal human stories. And uh, that's what I'm interested in, that's what I'm looking at. So I no longer want to be, I mean, you know, necessarily called an Iranian artist, uh, or an artist in fact, I mean, I mean will do. Uh, it's just, you know, I like to tell stories. That's how we have, I mean, throughout history, that's how our experiences have uh, pa been passed down or shared. And, you know, some people use a camera, a brush, a photo camera, um, um, or just writing or poetry or music. We like to share, we're social being, and we do more than, uh, I think maybe, t I think people have always, um, had these experiences where we're much more similar to each other than different. So um, I think perhaps we can focus on the similarity, not necessarily defending or trying to make changes, rather presentation. We can't really change. I mean, we cannot be responsible for a whole country. Yeah, yeah. We'd be really achieved if you're responsible just for ourselves, I think. And um, yeah, just presenting. I think. And I think we cannot cut the background. It's like part of us. Is all of the artists, all of the world. When you talk about Jeff Koons or Cindy Sherman, you remember about the history of United States. Or when you talk about the Bishers in the Germany, you, you remember about the, what happened in Germany. And in Iran is like that. I think is is it like all in, like all of the artists? It's very important where they're born, how they live, and what's the parent, or a lot of things. It's like Iranian. But the problem maybe in the Western view is like focus on just topic is Iran much more important than who is the artist and what artists do. So for, in, for example, when you know, publish the book about the artists, Iranian artists, definitely the name of the book, it's a title, is Iranian. But the German artist, the title is not the German artist, you know. For example, Hans. Yeah, yeah. 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 Hmm. yeah. <laughs> 